A long time ago, deluded people thought the world was round. So silly. They thought the sun was a star and the earth circled around it at an incredibly long distance. They imagined the moving stars weren't stars at all, but giant balls of rock and or gas that traveled likewise around the sun. How naive we were to think so. I'm so happy the world is flat. A little curved, yes, but flat nonetheless. And I'm so glad that heaven is so close. That Otis company can get you there if you push the right button. But why take an elevator when you could fly a carpet or a winged horse, of course? I'm so glad we took that package tour to Shangri-La. And even though everyone on the bus was late in their 15th or 16th life, Remembering the clattering sounds of their walkers on the bus steps will always make me smile. Remember when they ran television programs whose primary focus was to debunk magic? Really? Remember when televisions were only screens you couldn't climb into and play inside? Oh, I have some sunshine in a mason jar I've been saving for today. I've got some dark clouds in a basket when we need to make it rain. I've reserved a star to sit on for dinner tonight, and I've packed a basket with Molinari sandwiches and imported wine from China that's so clever it uncorks and drinks itself and then wobbles away unsteady. And we can play that game where we make shadow animals from the moonlight with our hands darkening California with giant hopping bunnies or what might be a chicken. And you can meet me there, flying on a carpet from a heaven that's really there. And I'll be running late, so I'll take an elevator up there. And I'll bring a blanket and some cards there. And the world will spread out wide under our eyes as magic is real. And all of those things happen for real and not be an impossibility like me picking up a phone and you would be on the other end. Because when that could have happened, it didn't. And now that it can't, it won't. And the sun gets all self-important and forces the planets into line. And stars scream out beyond comprehension into a deep void across time and space. And my carpet lies on the floor, just lies there, going nowhere. And when I sit on it, neither do I. Most sci-fi movies lie to us. When starships battle in space, there are no zapping sounds or explosions. Everything happens in perfect silence. A silent war. I don't know why this sounds more discomforting to me. When you watch the video of a tragedy with the sound off, it seems like less and more of one. Less because it doesn't seem real. More because you feel worse about yourself. Because you feel less about the victims. That said, hearing pain and anguish and seeing it, without seeing it, might be more powerful. The oral landscape from my bedroom window is all pain and anguish. But at times, late at night, it descends into perfect quietude. One that could explode in a moment, in a shouting match, or a squealing brake crunch traffic wreck on Mission Street quiet in a place that always wants to scream. It's the same as that dreamless sleep that follows a long day of physical labor when the junkies on the sidewalk stop their snore, but not like space quiet. There's an underlying ambient hum that I imagine are the combined heartbeats of San Francisco, anything but synchronized. The sun is sucked clean out. I got you. The sun is sucked clean out like a living, breathing person reduced to a glass, glassy eyed doll. Kate Folk. 
Every wall papered my block. Where you once could see cracks, now you can't. They're still there, but you can't see them. I've repopulated Soma streets with Walmart greeters who ask for nothing. Just say hello with a hollowness behind their eyes. I've adjusted the color balance of the sky to a bright marine layer gray, so all outdoors is blanched like the set of the Channel 5 news. Not sure what is more shocking, blood or bloodlessness. There was once a river running in place of 8th Street. Before all this, probably no more than a thick brook. And I wonder if the, if the live oaks grew up to the end of what I guess was the 600 block of Minna, covered with monarchs and pale blue butterflies. And those strange, thick California deer would graze the high bank where my second floor bedroom window is. Not sure if it's true, but it's been said that the city fathers back in the day named the alleyways after their favorite prostitutes. If I squint hard enough, I could see Minna in the light of a kerosene lamp in a sparsely furnished 19th century room as far as Ali goes, Minna is more prominent than most. So I assume that more than one city father succumbed to her charms. In my mind, she has raven hair. And when she moves, she could be Asian or Mexican or native or Russian or black. In the dim light, she can be anything. But for sure, she's always half something and half something else. Somehow, against the circumstance of her times, she overcomes the fate of so many other Soma Alley girls and outlived those who paid for her services and tried to win her affection with a street sign or not. Maybe her paramours, the city fathers, mark, named the street to assuage the guilt they felt for treating her the way they did, for blood on her hands, like the blood on the needles and hand wipes and sidewalks that litter her namesake, where people punch their feet sitting on a street trying to summon something when there is nothing, decorating my environ with snack cracker wrappers and orange plastic needle caps, and the river that was a street is again a river, but it has no water, only blood. And it's always in flood, drains clogged with bodies, killed by a contagion of despair. And I can't step outside for fear of being swept upon it. And the sky cries blood until it doesn't. And that rare rain falls, a powerful cataract from above. And everything that seemed irredeemable is brightened by heavy clouds. And my neighbor hands a roll of garbage bags out through the gate to those outside on the sidewalk to become improvised plastic ponchos. And the drains are still clogged, but with the leaves of magnolia trees falling from the branches to imitate armadas of boats piloted by incompetent sailors bouncing off each other in a, and wrecking in a pile in a pond caused by the incompetence of the Department of Public Works. Minna, oh Minna, the DPW let you down. And the junkies let you down. Just as the city fathers let you down. And I know that I've let you down because everything I know about you I've made up past your first name. And having known people in the sex trade, that's probably fake too. But I try to put color in your cheeks and a sparkle in your eyes and bridge our times before you and me and everything that has been will be wallpapered over and your street, my street, our street becomes Salesforce Place or Uber Way and no one walks on it. It's only traversed by autonomous vehicles delivering organic avocado toast to phallic high rises. And though Avocado toast is delicious. My wish is it won't block your memory or chase me away from you. We still have things 
to do. Here it is. Clip, clop. When a horse goes down the path, it goes clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. So therefore, when it goes backward, I guess it has to go bulk, bilk, bulk, bilk. Because that's how you spell it when you go backwards. And she said... Frack you and the horse you rode in on. And all I can say is, it's okay if you don't like me. But let's leave the horse out of this, okay? He may not be the best horse, but he's still my horse. And that's cold. That's just so cold. It reminds me of rule number one. Always wear a warm coat because the world is cold. It might be summer, but bummer, the world is still cold. Rule number two, don't rock around with a gun because you'll shoot someone, but probably yourself. And you'll think they deserve it, but odds are they don't. Unless you shoot yourself, then of course they do. Rule number three, watch your mouth, because in truth, only bad people or horses say what they think. Good people or horses say what they have to say. I say what I think. My horse, you'd have to ask him. Bad people also make lists of things other people should do. So don't do that. If you're counting, that's rule number four. I ride a horse called Hypocrisy, and he eats all my wild oats, and I've thought through every possible scenario, and I'm here to say, we're screwed. I want to take a moment of your time, a moment more than the one I took before. I carry a garbage bag can around for that purpose, and I've filled it with so many moments, I can live seven more lives as long as I spend them in that can. Part of me smiles manically at other people. The other part of me is embarrassed by my face. Part of me might be brave, but generally I listen to the other part. Part of me talks about myself like somehow that's relevant or important. The better part of me talks about my horse. My horse, hypocrisy, likes to drink and gets mad at drunks, especially when he's drunk, and damn, he's drunk a lot. My horse thinks he's pretty smart. He does everything wrong every time in exquisite epic social failure. But yeah, he's smart-ish, I guess. My horse learned to walk backwards. So now that's pretty much his only direction. Polk, pilk, polk, pilk, polk, pilk. Always back against the traffic. And people blow their horns at him. But you don't need blinders not to see. He just leads with his ass. And you think that might be awkward or rare. You should know. It is awkward. My other horse is obsessed, op oppressed, paranoid. And he's not all that special. We've all got one of those. But he's even more difficult to ride. Because he's both oppressed and paranoid, he's got two asses pointed out at either end, and he tends to kick at everything he hasn't already shit all over. Hypocrisy whinnies at me. Hey, Charlie, says he, let's back through everything blissfully. And I put on my stretchy pants and crazy shiny silk vest and little black helmet and climb aboard as we back through the world. Poke, pilk, poke, pilk. And it really feels like we're getting somewhere. Should I do one more? Yeah. You have time? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name's Charlie. I'm going to do one more. This is the one I was going to do later, but.
somewhere that might be German. Might have been a long time ago. But out of the stage and flickering lights and lightning rose Karl Marx. In a leather vest and some leather pants. Bare armed, save for two full sleeve tattoos. <laughs> of the complete communist manifesto. A sopping wax, heaving masses churned in the mud before him. His thick gray beard and his white dude, white afro, swirl in the wind. He raises both arms over his head, growls into the mic, and a million decibel speech proclaims I reject the advancement and any association. With any association that would associate with the life system. And the thunder claps like a rim shot from heaven. How do you see yourself? A question advertising asks is where do you see yourself in X number of years? Imply that with a little planning and some saving, yes, your dreams are available, are attainable, so long as they can be with a modest annuity. Well, an annuity, modest or no, wouldn't hurt. Dreams often defy spreadsheet calculations. A line goes out the door of people trying to win a billion and a half dollars. And I would feel morally superior if I had not just spent two bucks on the ticket. <laughs> Where do you want to be? There's a sports meme on the internet that I just love. It shows pictures of fans in an arena at that one point in the game when the game is lost. They stand with their hands on their heads, their elbows extended, as if they are trying to win. The internet, in its infinite wisdom, calls this pose the surrender cobra. And once you know about the surrender cobra, you can't look at another sporting event and not see it. And I'd love to knock it. It's kind of easy to mock people who care about something that means nothing. But the truth is, anyone who cares about anything, beyond what they see in the mirror, or bank account, or what can be considered their parochial realm, even if it's just their city, their hometown, their childhood, or, you know, a blue shirt, should be beyond mocking if it can only be I can see old Karl Marx somewhere, maybe London, at the end of 1848. After all the revolutions he prophesied, the prophesized the previous winter were ground into nothing. He stands at the window of a cheaply rented room, looking out at the street, his hands on his head, his elbows poking out. Makes you think of a crowd of disciples on what I guess was a terrible Friday standing under a cross on Golgotha, baking in the Judean sun, would bet for sure that at least one of those dudes was rocking a surrender cobra. What now, Peter? Peter is asked, whilst Peter tries to figure out how to get his fishing boat back. Peter, where do you see yourself in 10 years? In 20? It's not that we all go gentle into that midnight. I read that the greatest of Napoleon's generals, the Field Marshal Ney, had such bearing and was so fearless, he commanded his own firing squad. That said, it's possible when that last battle was lost on that field in Belgium made famous by the Abbasong, even on his horse, even with a saber in his hand, he might have rested his clenched fists upon a plumed helmet. I don't know. I wasn't there. And whether you believe per Jesus personally had a comeback or not, you can say definitively his disciples surely did. Founding a giant world religion. And though it ended badly for more than a few of them, they crucified Peter upside down. Old Karl Marx got to see another round of revolutions fail before he died. His resurrection coming at the hands of autocrats who put his face on their terror. And though he's probably blameless for the 
massacres perpetuated in his name. He was naive enough to advocate for a dictatorship, which surely enabled intellectually at least their execution. But in Carl's defense, humans don't generally need intellectual cover to oppress other humans. There was never a phrase in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Thou shalt forcibly re-educate the gays, for if they should marry, that would somehow gay up the world, which would be a bad thing in a Christian sense. <laughs> Betty, he advocated for the opposite. For who are the meek, if not those cowed in submission by the strong? It's said that every dog has its day, and the meek shall inherit the earth. And workers, you have nothing to lose but your chains. You have a world to win. Let the rain swirl, let the lightning crash. Let the dead climb up from under the earth to try, try again. Maybe our books, our manifestos, our Bibles weren't written hundreds or thousands of years ago. Maybe they are yet to be written down. They swirl in the world around us, and you can't see them yet, but they're here. And though we stand today under this sun, under these stars, with our hands on our heads, staring into space in heart-rending disbelief, let that searing pain between our lungs turn our hearts to steel, impervious to both jackhammers and jack asses. A better world is not to be found in the past or in the either. It's in the future. Someone much smarter than me is breathing, whose ideas become words that stitch the world together and they may not emerge in my lifetime, and they might fail in theirs, but everyone who would feel marginalized, marginalized from those long disappeared Samaritans through the lottery ticket buying neo-proletarians in blue shirts, to all of those green-skinned quintessexuals, oh, I know they don't exist, yet we're all playing the same game. And Darwin and or God or both has yet to show their hand. So all those green-skinned quintessexuals, they will all find, they all will fit in a world getting warmer as its annual mean temperature goes down. And all those generations to come will have to figure out how to solve their own problems because we found a way to solve.